So hello and welcome. Happy Friday the 13th. That's right. It's Friday the 13th, 13th day of August. And this is episode number 121 of Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers. So this is the way to be. If you want other pertinent information that you may find valuable and links to products that we might talk about today, please look down in the video description below. If you have questions of your own, follow the link to the website also in the video description that takes you to the way to be.org. So thank you for those of you who are tuning in today. Thank you for visiting. And if you're brand new, welcome. If you've been here before, thanks for coming back, even though you know what I'm like. So let's get right into it. Starting with question number one, Carmen Reed, Tampa, Florida. Migratory versus telescoping covers. Why use one over the other? Does it simply come down to cost? There's a practical end to migratory covers. I don't have them for full size hives, but I can show you what they look like because we use them on the nucleus hives. That's a migratory cover. So when it goes on the hive, all it has is a leading edge that goes down and a edge for the back that goes down, sits flush on your hive without an inner cover. This is the inner cover. Sometimes people like to put a piece of canvas on the backs of the frames in that hive, then the migratory cover on, and the sides of it match up with the sides of your beehive. So this edge right here would match flush with the side of your beehive boxes. Why would they do that, do you think? It really has uh, a utility application for commercial beekeepers and that's because they put all their hives side by side on pallets and they stack them. So when it comes to stacking and getting them right up next to each other so you can strap them up and have them secured for shipment, that really is the number one reason for having migratory covers. Are they cheaper? Yeah, because there's less wood, less material in there, but they create telescoping covers also that make a standoff space. So here's the side wall of your hive, here's the next hive. Now we got two telescoping covers which push them apart even if you bump them together. Now we have a space between the hives. Therefore not great for palleting those up and shipping them. So migratory, you're going to move the hives, we're going to ship them around. Migratory covers. That's where that really comes from. It's that simple. So thanks for that question. It was an easy one. So telescoping covers if you have the option and you, of course you're into backyard beekeeping, you're going to use a telescoping cover more likely than not of some kind. Next question, number two. Bears Parish, Oakland, California. Found new queen in inspection this week and used one-handed marker and I got a tiny speck on the top of her right eye. Quickly I put her back in the hive before the paint dried. Did I do the right thing? How much danger is there in losing this queen? It was the tiniest of specks, but I'm still worried. When it comes to marking your queen honeybee, and I had another question this week about the colors. Where did those originate? Who decided it? Who's in charge of what colors to mark the queen bees and what years and things like that? Well, there is an international standard for it. Will you raise good bees? We're in white right now. So for 2021, we marked all the thoraxes with white. And this is critical. Mark the thorax only. Head, thorax, abdomen. Leave the abdomen absolutely alone. Leave their eyes absolutely alone because they have to see. And we don't want to damage their antenna. We don't want to damage their forelimbs. So they're insects. They have six legs. Those front two legs are pretty darn critical. So do I think, you know, it sounds like a little tiny speck on the eye. Is that probably going to be the end of the world? No, it just matters what the bees think of her and how well she functions and if she can do what she needs to do. It's probably going to be fine, but it is a cautionary tale. If you don't have super steady hands and you've got your little queen and you're going to mark her, or she's moving around too much and you haven't got her set, you used a one-handed queen catcher. That's what this is right here. So I like to get the queen parallel with these. So I have her head, her abdomen, and her tail, her, no, her head, her thorax, and her abdomen all lined up in here. And then I got a straight shot. She's not moving because we're holding her still with this little squishy piece of styrofoam here. 
So we push her up against that, and then when she's there, nice and still, very steady hands. If you've got really shaky hands, you've had five cappuccinos, or you're an espresso drinker, or you're just generally nervous. People are always sneaking up on you and scaring you and stuff like that. Give that job to somebody who has really steady hands who can really just put a dot on there exactly where it needs to be. Then as soon as she gets the paint on her thorax, open this up, let her move around, she dries out. Then you open it, restore her to the hive. Try not to get paint on any other part of her body. And of course, stay away from her abdomen. But anyway, I hope that uh, Barris will keep us up to speed on how well she did if they groomed it off of her eyes. The good news is the eyes are not smooth. The eyes have hair sticking out on them. These hairs also protect the eyes. So if that little touch of paint got on one of those hairs out there, very good chance that she's still going to get that groomed off by her retinue. Those are the attending nurse bees that take care of the queen and keep her groomed up all the time. Question number three, moving right along. Ann Pfeiffer from Durham, North Carolina. What does it say here? Thanks so much for thoughtful information. I appreciate your comments on how to deal with a honey-bound hive. The brood area was backfilled while the hive was queenless. The brood area was backfilled while the hive was clean, queenless. That's important to know. After I installed a new queen, there was a bit of brood in the deep, but the queen moved into the honey super, which was almost full. Now I have scattered brood there too. This hive had an empty medium with wax plastic foundation, which they would not use. I now have brood in the honey super and very scattered in the brood box. Help. I have no idea what is best to do here. Okay, well, when you lose a queen, by the way, because it's another way that we look for indications that the hive is, is or is not queen right. Queen right, a colony with a laying queen present. Queen mandibular pheromone is going everywhere through the bees. They're all happy. They're doing all their jobs. One of the jobs that they do when the queen is present is they're drawing out comb. So they're doing wax work. They're expanding the infrastructure of the hive because they have a queen that's laying, that's going to be producing more brood, and more brood requires more space, more space, food, resources, everything else, off it goes. So one of the things that slows down or even stops when the queen's absent, wax production. So this uh, statement here about with wax plastic foundation, which they would not use, my question about that is, do they start using it after you put the queen in there? So that's interesting too. But it is very important this time of year, and that's why this question is pertinent to what's going on in the northeastern United States right now, other parts of the U.S. We're about to get into this big nectar flow. For a lot of people, this is the only big nectar flow for them. So in the northeastern United States, we're going to get goldenrod, which is already opening, by the way. Can't tell if that's early or not this year. We have asters, joe pie weed, ironweed, cosmos are blooming. Things are about to get crazy. So as backyard beekeepers, we're going to have to be diligent. You're going to have to expand their spaces ahead of the nectar flow. Don't wait till the box is full. Then, oh, it's full. Now we're going to put stuff on. You have to do it ahead of time. Because if they build up and there's a late season swarm, like happened here this past week, a late season swarm. And I did find the culprit, by the way. The swarm came from one of my nucleus colonies. Nucleus colonies small spaces, even though I put doubles, so they're 10 frame nucleuses. So probably it's not a nuke anymore. It's actually a small hive. They built up so many bees and they swarmed. So good size swarm out of that. But anyway, these are the things that happen in the absence of a queen. Infrastructure stops or slows way down. So bringing in the new queen, you need to make sure that you evaluate all the frames of your hive at that point. If you have full frames of honey, move those to the outermost position. So if it's a 10 frame, Number one position, number 10 position, fullest frames of capped honey. Then moving in, we have pollen and everything else. And of course, the frames with the least amount of resources stored on them go to the center. That's where we're hoping that the queen is going to lay her eggs, your new one. And if there's not enough space for that, we have to expand up into the supers. Super, over. So we move them up, that's extra honey space. And we wanna make sure that there's empty frames areas where the bees can store the resources in close proximity to what has been the brood area because that's where they go first. 
when they run out of space, they stick their nectar everywhere. They need twice the space for fresh nectar that they will need for the finished honey when it's completely dehydrated. So the other thing that happens is your queen honeybee. This is a time of year also of increase in the population of your bees. At least where I live. So what's happening, your queen is going to be laying eggs in every available spot and it's up to the bees. They call it policing. When a queen lays eggs where they shouldn't be, the bees can go around the workers and they can actually eat those eggs. So spotty brood is inefficient for the bees. So we want the queen to be able to have an area of drawn comb central to your hive so that we have a nice solid pattern of brood. Number one, that shows us that we have a really good queen that she's consistent with available space. And the other thing is it's efficient because now they cluster over that to keep it warm during these cold nights now or they can also concentrate their feed. So you'll see rings of pollen stored, and then of course, nectar and honey immediately adjacent to those brood areas. So it's up to you to provide that for them. Now, if you find out that things are getting honey bound and look like they might be making preparations to swarm, you see swarm cells being made, even though it's here we are this time of year, um, you can't just put in clean foundation. You have to put in drawn cells. So either it has to be cells that have been worked by the bees before that you possibly extracted when you extracted honey. So your supers directly over that brood box should have frames of drawn cells ready to be used by the bees. Because when they're starting to make preparations to exit the hive and they're going to swarm late in the year, which is not good for the bees and it's not good for you, if you spot that and then you throw in a bunch of heavy wax foundation and you expect them to draw it out, they don't do it. Yeah, I know, because they've already decided they're leaving that house. They're not going to make any more improvements to it on their way out the door. So, drawn cell. Now, what if you don't have it? You're a brand new beekeeper. You don't have cells pre-drawn. I heard the Permacum is out of business. That The inventor or the owner of that might have passed away. I can't validate that, but Permacum was one of the only plastic fully drawn deep cell frames that you could get. The second uh, thing that you could get, which now is back in stock, is by Better Bee, Better Comb, synthetic wax, wired. You can put that immediately above or even get a deep frame of that right next to your brood area and give them room for expansion right away. So Better Comb is like the only drawn comb available now that I know of. So you have to move things around on your bees if they're looking like they're honey bound and they're so productive and you, you fell down. I mean, I don't fall down, but you probably fell down and didn't get ahead of them with your frames. But let's be honest, we've all done it. You open up a hive, you thought they were just tinkering around and not doing very well and the whole thing is chock-a-block with honey and you didn't get ahead of them in time. So keep ahead of them, you've been warned. We're heading into a nectar flow in the United States, northeastern part. Question number four, moving on. Beginner. That's a funny YouTube name. I have a question about the new B-Smart insulated inner cover. Can it be used effectively for additional insulation if I place, if placed over a feeding super rather than underneath the feeding super? The feeding supers I have were made by gluing standard wood. Okay, I'm making changes around here. And a lot of people are asking about that uh, B Smart Designs, that new insulated inner cover slant uh, feeder shim. It functions as both. And if you've been watching me, I spent all this time and effort coming up with my own feeder shim design so I could put rapid rounds in it. So I've got the space in there that I control ventilation through. And then the insulated cover goes on top of that. Well, B Smart Designs. I haven't done a video about this yet. That's why people are asking, Fred, you can do a video about that? I am. I have to test it. I have to evaluate it. I have these out in my bee yard right now. The other thing is, when I collected that swarm this past week and I made a video about it, see how this has an upper entrance here? They're like, Fred, is that upper entrance open? Is there a way to close it? It arrives in a closed position. How do you open and close the entrance? This polystyrene insert is the insulation. I believe the R value is R10. But if you look underneath of it, you can see the groove. 
that groove is what makes that an upper entrance. So turn this way, see how it's solid this way? And here's the hole. When you turn it this way, it is not an upper entrance. So you have the choice. So no matter what school of thought you have or follow, if you want an upper entrance, you just flip this around that way and it's got a channel. They go up through this hole on the bottom. They go right through and they go to the outside. The other funny thing too is underneath, this is convex. In other words, if you were to look at it from underneath, this is not a flat piece of plastic underneath. It kind of bows up a little bit and that's so condensation runs across down the walls and so on. This fits on an eight or 10 frame. This is not my review of it. I'm not ready. I'm still testing it, but I like it so far and I've put it on six or seven colonies right now. Obviously I have to have it on some and not on others, but uh, how would you use it? So when I have the feeder shim that I had on all of my hives and I did all that work and made them out of really good stuff, I'm taking the feeder shims off now and not using them anymore. Although going into this winter, I will have some feeder shims, insulated hive covers, telescoping covers. And then on other hives, I will have this new insulated inner cover. Of course, now that puts the insulated portion right in the immediate vicinity of the upper super going into winter. So where the honey stores are and where the bees ultimately end up is in the top of the hive inside underneath. This is insulated. Rapid round sits on top of that. How does that look? It's a rapid round. Here's a rapid round. It goes right on there. And if you're not using that, see, they try to think of everything with this. If you're not using your rapid round, see, it's still held here by this piece of tape. That's the black cover, the cap that goes there and closes that off if you don't want that to be used by the bees. So the other thing is people that have those um, robbing screens, also by Bee Smart Designs, they go right into this space right here. So a good friend of mine, member of my beekeeper association, said, hey, Fred, remind me not to buy everything you talk about before you've tested it. Because he bought a bunch of stuff that looked cool because I was talking about it. But so I want you to know, I'm evaluating it. It looks great so far. I'm not saying you should run out and buy one right now. I bought a pile of them. Uh, I was sent two of them for free in the very beginning to evaluate the beta version of these. So I have been involved in giving my feedback before these finally got released. And now that they're released, as soon as I saw that and the changes that they made, I jumped on it and bought 10 of them. Bought 10 of them. They were not given to me. So people that think that everything I do... Uh, here's the other thing. It comes with little clips. So you can vent, again, this is for both schools of thought. Look what else is on here. See this little raised section? That's so you can get your hive tool in there and lift it up without damaging the wood. These are insulating. These are promising. I like it. I'm using them. I voted with my dollars. But as I said, I'm just evaluating them. So this idea about over or under the feeding shim I say replace the feeding shim with this because guess what sits on on top of that? An empty medium box that just gives you the space to put your feeder on. So liquid or dry feed for emergency feeding. Now what am I going to put on that box that's on top of that insulated inner cover? An insulated outer cover also redundant, probably not as effective, but the real insulation is going to happen now directly on that feeder box. So I'm excited about it. And I'm also going to have equipment available going into winter this year where I can see the differences in what's going on and the one that has that and the ones that don't. Also, I'm going to put thermal checks on these hot days for hives that have these hive gates as compared to those who do not. We're going to see what the temperature buildup is inside each of those hives and if these are really good for venting hives on hot days. And you know, it's relevant. I'm not in Texas. I'm not in the desert southwest where some of the hot days now are in the triple digits. Hot days for me are high 80s, low 90s. So anyway, I have not done a review on that cover. I plan to do it after months of practical testing. So I'll be introducing it, talking about the details, then the good and the bad. So don't blame me if you're out and get one right now and things are bad also, but they're looking good so far. So. Intermediate, 
endorsement of a new product that hasn't actually been thoroughly evaluated by me yet. So anyway, next is Jackie R. Question number five. Do bees need more resources in milder winters than they do in heavier ones like you have? I know your zone is colder than mine. A typical winter here is just cold and we get snow, but it usually sticks around for a few days then melts off. Our temps are regularly in the 30s and 40s, but occasionally drop below that into the 20s and teens. That's Fahrenheit. Since they may be more active on the warmer days of our winters, would they need more stores for winter than, say, a zone like yours, where they are going to be mostly dormant? Well, bees, by the way, if you're new to beekeeping, and a lot of beekeepers are new that are watching this channel, and a lot of people don't even keep bees, they just like information. That's one of the human conditions, is that we like to know things because we like to know things. So it's called a state of torpor. So when your honeybees, when the temps drop below 60, there's a lot of studies about that. When do they form a cluster? So it's roughly below 64 degrees. They start to cluster, and then the colder it gets, the tighter the cluster is. And uh, again, we try to provide them with a hive that keeps wind off of them because they insulate themselves with the bodies of bees. So a state of torpor is a metabolic rate that's lower but it's not a full dormant state so they are active they are humming a little and you go up to a hive in the winter time you can listen to the side of it and you can hear a little in there and uh so the less active the bees are that's why some people that want to know when their bees are alive or dead in the winter time and they go knocking on the hive and the, the bees hum and get going people will say why didn't you do that you just made them use a bunch of their resources a bunch of their energy and now they're going to have a tough time getting through winter. Well, the more active they are, the more resources they use. The more insulated the hive, the fewer resources they use. And that's true in summer or winter, by the way. Food for thought. So what do they consume? What do they need? So for this kind of question, how many supers does this beekeeper need to have to provide resources for bees that might have more flying days, more active days when they're moving around inside the hive. I actually really like those days. We didn't get many last year. Last year was devastating for a lot of beekeepers here in the state of Pennsylvania in the United States. That's because they didn't get cleansing flights. They didn't get those intermediate warm-up days when the bees could fly out and eliminate because they don't pollute the interior of the hive. They need to get out, they need to do things. The other thing is on these warm-up days, they break cluster. When they break cluster, that's good news because now they're moving around inside the hive and they're also allocating their resources, moving things around. And we're talking about the honey, of course. So there are benefits and drawbacks. And what you're going to find out is as you go season by season, year by year, you're going to find out, first of all, based on your observations of your hives, what kind of bees did you have? Because here's the other thing. Aside from climate, there are lines of bees known to be quieter through winter and others that are known to be more active through winter. The quieter bees use fewer resources. The more active bees in winter use more resources. Italians come to mind. They use a lot of resources going through winter. Not the end of the world, but you have to provide for that going into winter. Russian bees, for example, use fewer resources going into winter, and they're also quick to reduce their numbers. Their queens stop laying in periods of dearth. So they'll actually be a smaller colony of bees, which then again, bee by bee, they use fewer resources. So that's just food for thought. The other thing is talk to beekeepers in your area. Those who, when you get to your bee meetings, or you have your fellowship, I highly recommend you join a beekeeping organization. If for nothing else, to put you in touch with beekeepers that are in your zone that can tell you things like, yeah, I left 100 pounds of honey on, they used 40. And that's pretty consistent. I like to leave a little extra. So I used to say, you know, 50 to 100 pounds of extra honey. Well, last winter, I left insulated covers on all of my hives for the first time ever. Insulated covers on all of the hives, and I had the lowest honey consumption of any year previous. So I left 47 to 60 pounds of honey on every hive. And what I ended up with in spring was a huge surplus 
of stored winter honey. Does that mean I want to, you know, hedge my bets and just put the minimum amount, just what I think they're going to use. And then when they get there in the spring, they're all going to be up underneath that feeder shim or that insulated inner cover or whatever you're using. They're going to be at the top of the interior of that hive and still have food left over or have consumed that last little bit and boom, the spring nectar flow. And then they start migrating down. What do you want to do? So the game is, because it's just as bad, I know, this is complicated. It's just as bad if you leave too many supers on for an undersized colony. Because now they can't keep up with condensation on the comb. They can't police the areas inside the hive. And they can't make use of those resources either because the colony is just too small. So size right for the colony going into winter. Because as they start slowing down, end of October, early November, we get a really good assessment of exactly what the colony strength is. And that will also dictate how many resources need to be on. Too many resources, those colonies can cave because all that condensation builds up inside and they just can't handle it. Plus their honey can be ruined too. So your best resource for that, people local to you. But uh, I understand it's a concern. This is why record keeping is so important. What was the bee stock? How many bees did you have? How many frames of brood did you have? How many frames of bees did you have going into winter? Uh, and so on. So this will become your method. And those things are changing because, look, the weather is dynamic these days. Question number six, Daryl Hammer. I know you shouldn't treat for varroa mites unless testing indicates the level is too high to ignore. I also understand you should treat all hives in the apiary if you treat one. What if some of your hives appear to be resistant due to low numbers of mites despite no treatment, but others have high numbers? Is it then okay to treat some, but not others? I have a mixed bag of bees, as over the years, I have built my apiary from cutouts, swarms, packages, nukes, and purchased queens introduced to splits or queenless cutouts. This mixed bag likely accounts for the different reactions the hives have to mites. Your thoughts. Okay, and I actually asked, we were Zooming with Randy Oliver. If you don't know, Randy Oliver is a biologist. He does lots of research, lots of scientific study. Scientific Beekeeping is his website, so you can visit that. But one of the questions I asked him, because this is a concern, we're backyard beekeepers, so decisions we make about treating for mites um, don't hit the pocketbook really heavy. If we had 600 hives, these decisions are huge. So what I like to do is note the colonies that have the lowest mite counts. That shows me they're managing mites the best. And this is before doing any kind of treatment because my question for Randy was, uh, when you're treating, and I think we were talking about Formic Pro. Formic Pro has a tendency to drive a bunch of bees out of the hive, all over the face of it. They beard up and everything else because they're getting away from that powerful smell. So when they put Formic Pro on there and all these bees exit the hive, what prevents them from just abandoning that spot and going into the other hives that didn't require treatment in your own backyard apiary? How much drift occurs because treatment is being done on one colony and not the adjacent colonies? He said that has not been studied. So that's an inconclusive answer, but we do know that up to, there have been studies of bee drift. There have been studies in bee drift, if you don't know, is when the foragers leave and come back to the hive and sometimes they just randomly land on the landing board of an adjacent hive. If you have a bunch of hives in a row and they're all close together, the end colonies tend to pick up more drift than the center colonies. And that's because bees that are loaded with pollen, nectar, and resources land on those hives and get invited in because we're bringing resources. So up to 30%, I believe, of the working force in some colonies have been from other colonies. So that lets us know what's going on, and that's without treating. That's just routine intermixing of hives, which is why hives and colonies that are farther apart tend to do better 
and then they are independent from one another when it comes to drifting and problems like that. So what I do is I document the colonies that had the lowest mite numbers. And here's an example of when I treat every single hive. Because if you treat them ahead of time, then you do mite checks, you have no idea. Mite checks are critical to determining your stock, who's doing great, who is not. Mites are doing really, or mites, Colonies that are doing really bad and that become mite bombs, this is anything over, for me, anything over 3%. So if you took a scoop of 300 bees, you did your mite wash, your alcohol wash, your detergent wash, whatever you did, if you got more than nine, nine mites in that count, that's a threshold that you're crossing. For me, that may require intervention for those mites because otherwise they're just going to continue to increase. And what happens when you tend to leave those colonies alone and you say, oh, I'm just going to sort them out. Maybe you're um, more natural beekeeping and you don't want to do any treatments at all. And you can do it. But when you get a colony that hits that threshold, you need to get them out of there. Because you are impacting other colonies of bees with these foragers that drift. And yes, as the colony starts to decline, as it becomes overwhelmed by mites, they spread out. What else happens when they're in a weakened state and that fall nectar flow has happened? They get robbed. When they get robbed, you're spreading mites. So you're spreading mites to colonies that otherwise would have been great for managing them on their own, but now we have what's known as a mite bomb. It gets worse than that, by the way. So I'm gonna get on my, I'm gonna get on my uh, soapbox here in the town square and talk a little bit about this thinking because I was treatment free myself. I went along that thought line. I wished it worked perfectly, but when you get a colony that is collapsing due to mite loads, it isn't just the mites. It is all of the disease that the mites are spreading, which gets spread to those bees, which those bees spread liberally not just to other hives that they might move into, but they even impact native bee species because they're spreading their spores onto the flowers of the wildlife, of nature, of the environment. So one of the biggest ones that was impacted, what's one of the worst things that uh, the Varroa destructor mite spreads that gets spread to other bees? Deformed wing virus. Sometimes you just see DWV, they have DWV, deformed wing virus. They found that virus present on so many different flowers adjacent to beekeeping operations and bumblebees were contracting that. So this idea that we just let them collapse, let nature sort it out and let whoever lives live and whoever dies die, that is not working because this dying colony becomes a food resource and therefore a petri dish for all the diseases that are in the hive. They get visited by strong colonies, Herculean colonies that go in there and steal all their stuff because they're in a weak position so they prevail and come home with diseases and piggyback mites and everything else. So the idea of treating all of the colonies has traction in a small apiary. My plan this year was to remove any colonies that require treatment to another apiary and have an apiary that would require treatment. And those that had the low mite numbers would just be kept without treatment. And that's my breeding stock. And that's my plan going forward. But I can't leave the colonies that had the high mite counts alone and I can't keep them here because I don't want them interacting with each other. So they have to go and they get treated or you can euthanize the colonies that suffer disease, that can't handle mites, and then you keep those that did not require treatment and never hit that 3% threshold. So these are all decisions that every backyard beekeeper has to take. Some beekeepers are not counting mites. So I don't know what to say there. They just look at the bees and think everything is doing great. But then in the spring, often they'll say, well, my bees died and nobody knows why. And so-and-so's bees died too. So I don't feel bad. I mean, it wasn't something I did. And I always ask, what was the mite load like going into winter? And like, well, I didn't count them, but I just knew they were great. You should have seen the brood. Everything was great. The numbers were up. Everything was great. They stored honey and everything else. But see, they crash in winter. So... The mites have done their damage before winter arrives because who did they damage? The winter bees, the fat bodied bees that we depend on to keep everything healthy and to develop that brew during winter. All right, that's enough talk about that. 
We'll move on. Treat all hives or not? That is the question. I say if you've got three or four hives, two out of three or four hives had the high mite counts, treat them all. It's in your backyard apiary. They're in close proximity. A very high risk that even during treatment, they're going to migrate to the other hives that are healthy and cause them to also be diseased. It's bad stuff. Next one, Ed McDonald, question number seven. I have a queenless, eggless, bloodless hive. I don't know what that means, bloodless hive. That was half of a split a month ago. It produced a queen, but she hasn't been seen in the last three weeks. The other half of the split has a good laying queen. Would it be possible to just recombine these two hives? I'd be worried that by just transferring the queen and a couple of frames of resources from that hive, there wouldn't be enough time for the losing hive to make another queen, put enough resources away to survive winter in Northwest PA. Any advice would be appreciated. I have advice for Ed. I would combine them. I've had a really good uh, success with finding late season colonies that uh, are missing a queen for one reason or another. So they're in decline. Without the queen, their numbers are going down. And they seem healthy in every other way, except their numbers are dwindling, they're missing a queen, and they're not the friendliest colony. They also are susceptible now to being robbed and everything else. So you take the weaker colony you have the stronger colony that has the queen that's described here that they were taken from in the first place during the split. We put newsprint on them. You can get newsprint that doesn't have newsprint on it. It's a type of paper. I have rolls of it. It is cheap stuff. You put that on the box of your current strong hive with the queen. You cut little holes in the paper. You spritz it with some sugar syrup just to entice them. And then you take that whole box that's got the declining colony and you put it right on top of there and yes you combine them and they combine very quickly and guess what else because these are genetically related they're going to get along faster and make their connections quicker and then everything is going to be great i bet you don't even see a bunch of fighting and stuff on the landing board or dead bees being dragged out or anything else so some people like to add an upper entrance during that period because you're combining two i don't i just cut the holes in the paper and uh, you'll find that a bunch of workers, especially nurse bees, because they're total pushovers, they start squeezing down into the lower box right away. And they just join forces with the other nurse bees down there. And uh, you're going to find that's a very good way to get a very strong colony. Because the colony that was being robbed last year, and it was being robbed, why? Because they didn't have a queen, because the numbers were down. And uh, I combined both colonies together. They're one of my strongest hives. I made two splits from that hive this year, and they're all doing really well. And they'll take the paper out of there. So I recommend to Ed and anybody else in that circumstance, you want a really strong colony going into winter, just combine them the way that I just described. It is very simple. You'll, you'll wonder why you don't do that with every wheat colony that you have, if you have wheat colonies. Combining them really gets them going. Next question, number eight, Thomas Komet. Let's see, what are your thoughts on using heavy prepped acorn deep drone plastic foundation for supering and what is the approximate travel of our clusters in winter in our northeast ohio southwest pennsylvania thanks again well where i am northwest pennsylvania butts up against northeast ohio but anyway this is what we're talking about what is that it has a drone frame. What makes it a drone frame? Well, it's green, because so you'll know the difference, so that when you're looking at the backs of them, you'll know that's a drone frame. This is made by Acorn, it's heavy wax. I carry these around because I like to teach people about stuff and what's available. Now the question is, should we take this, because it's obviously a deep frame, goes into a deep brood box, usually on the outskirts, and that's so that we can get drones, the cells for male bees, the eggs get laid in here, they draw it out, they cap them, and then what's capped in there with the drones? We pull it out, we've got a bunch of varroa mites within there. So it's part of an integrated pest management program. The question is, could I put this brood box down here, upper box, use these just for honey? Would the bees use them for honey? The bees would draw them out. And when they're not making drones, they use drone cells for honey resources. Could you use that in an upper box going into winter and let them store honey in it? I say no. I say don't do it. Why wouldn't you do that, Fred? Well, because what happens to the bees as they go into wintertime? They're starting down here, 
in a brood box. Now we've got at least one medium super up here, chock-a-block with honey, and then the bees are going to consume that honey as it migrate up into winter. They like to move vertical, right? So then what are they going to do? They're going to consume the honey. There would be nothing wrong with the fact that they were drone-sized cells as they move up and they consume the honey. But what happens later in winter? As we get towards spring, we hit about February time frame. They really start kicking in their new brood at winter time. So where's the brood going to happen? Where the cluster is? Where's the cluster? Up in that upper box. So now we've got them on drone comb. So we have a brood issue, in my opinion. I mean, I haven't tried it. I'm just tossing some theory out there. So now we have drone cells up there. If the bees follow the imprint that's embossed in the bottoms of these frames, so I highly recommend that we only use drone comb and drone frames on the out, outermost parts of your brood boxes. And you could use them if you've got them and you want to put a couple number one position, number 10 position of a 10 frame hive and use them there. That's great because when they start to develop their winter brood, that doesn't happen out on the outer walls or in position one or 10. It happens in the middle, slightly towards the sunrise side because your hive is likely pointed statistically for success, the landing board is south to the southeast for the most successful wintering hives. So I recommend you don't do that. And that's my thinking. Acorn's good foundation though. And there are a lot of people that do that, uh, pulling out. If you've got chickens, your chickens get used to eating those drone comb and of course the little varroa mites and stuff. And no, the varroa mites don't get out of there, get on the chickens and find their way back to a hive. The only way varroa mites get around is on the bodies of other honeybees. So yeah, that can work. That's one of many levels of natural varroa pest management. Next question, number nine comes from Jay Arnold. If you're given one-to-one -one sugar water to build comb on super frames, does it matter if you use a frame feeder in the brood box, which is the big deep box down below, or you need a frame feeder in the super? Okay, I'm the wrong person to ask about frame feeders because I don't like them. <laughs> so, I'm just rare that I say I don't flat like something, but I'm going to explain my philosophy here. And for somebody who doesn't like them, why would you have one, right? So I have one. This is a frame feeder. Where does it go? It takes the place of a frame, in this case, in a deep box. This is a very large frame, right? It's, it's weird shape. See, here's a normal Langstroth frame. What's going on with this one? Why is it narrow like that? What's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. It's a lay-ins frame. So it goes in the lay-ins hive, which, by the way, my lay-ins hive does have bees now. And this I bought from Dr. Leo Sherishkin's website, horizontalhive.com, I believe. And it has all the heavy ridges in it and everything else, but I'll tell you why I don't like them. Number one, where is it? It's down below, and if you're in Langstroth boxes that you stack, in order to access this feeder to fill it or to check on it to see what the levels are, you have to remove the hive cover, you have to remove the inner cover, you have to remove the medium super, and then you have to get down here into one of the deeper boxes, and then you have to see it, and then if it needs filling, then you have to fill it. That's one problem. This is why I like hive top feeders, like rabbit round feeders. Because you pull the lid off, the feeder's right there, you see the levels, you check it, you service it, you never interact with the bees or mess up their day, especially when it comes winter time when you're likely to need emergency feeding but then we don't use syrup anyway right so we're talking one-to-one -one syrup that leads me to the other reason why i'm hesitant to use um, frame feeders like this what do you see here to cover this feeder because this is the these will be the cover boards right and all this open area here and then the feed goes in here and so do the bees go in there and they get their footing on these ridges nicely designed and also have ridges on the outside too so the bees can get their footing but what's wrong with that when the bees are trying to dehydrate the honey that they're storing we have a lot of surface area here of liquid one-to-one -one sugar syrup 
that the bees are also trying to dehydrate. They would be trying to fan the surface here and to dry out to reduce the humidity inside the hive at a time when they're harvesting honey, nectar, and they're harvesting nectar making honey. So that's another reason why I don't like to have frame feeders. So frame feeders are my least favorite feeder for those reasons. Now another thing that I would like to see people come out with, uh, little feeder rafts that go in here that would reduce the surface area, that would provide openings only for the bees to get their little tongues in there so then they could get the syrup. And of course, this is in three segments, see? So each raft would have to ride the syrup down lower as it gets consumed by the bees. The raft would also have to not sink too fast when the bees are really hungry and they dogpile in here and they're pushing each other into the sugar syrup. So I think work needs to be done on designs like this that reduces the surface area, provides a movable float that the bees stand on and then the bees can lick it and that reduces um, the amount of humidity that these would be contributing to the hive. So whether it goes in a lower box, upper box, the upper box, if you had the option, if I was going to put one of these up there, I would put it in the upper box just because the reasons that I just described, that's another box that I don't have to pull off to get to it. I don't want to have to smoke the bees, open the hive every time I want to service a feeder. So that's where rapid round feeders on an inner cover of any kind or now the new insulated cover because look what happens with this thing. The rapid round feeder is sitting on here. Just illustrating why it's my preferred method. The hive is down below. This area is all intact. This is in contact with the box rim. So they're going to glue all that up. That's the other thing. They're gluing that up with propolis, propolis, whatever you want to call it. And they're sealing these joints in preparation for winter to keep rain and wind out. So if our frame feeder is down below, we have to pull this cover off. We have to break that seal and that's repair work that the bees have to do after we're done. What if it's really cold? those repairs may not happen at all. So that's another drawback. You have to smoke them if you're gonna go down into there. So in the winter time even, or cold days, or even on a perfect day, you're just out there drinking your coffee, you wanna check on your bees, you pull that outer cover, you pull this cover, you can fill this up even more, you put the lid back on, you can see how many bees are up in there, you can see how much they're taking, these are translucent, you see through the sides, you see what the levels are, we never, annoyed or interrupted the bees and the best part too we didn't have to smoke them so curacell another company also makes hive top feeders that sit right on top but it takes up the whole thing and it is the frame so it is the box which is bulkier than this but there again the reason that we're looking at these this year is because they're insulated but my Feeder shims also took advantage of that. And let me tell you, it's convenient. So I know if you've been using the feeder shims, some other hive top configuration, that is the best of all worlds when it comes to feeding your bees. If you don't have to get down into their brood boxes and everything else. So I hope that helps you out. Question number 10, this comes from Buddy Roll. During an earth period, no honey supers. Is it possible to overfeed one to one sugar water? And every time I replenish one to one sugar water in my Layens hive, plastic feeder, look at that. In my Layens hive, plastic feeder. So Buddy Roll is talking about this exact feeder right here. The bees start doing front of the hive imitation orientation flights. Why? Well, I can't really explain why they're imitating orientation flights when you're filling this feeder, when you service your Layens hive. See, the Layens hive, the frames of the Layens frames, they all run side to side and they form the cover board. There is no room for them to get up into some hive top feeders. The Layens hive is another level of you have no feeder choices other than to put in a frame feeder, which happens to be sold by Dr. Sherishkin. So I don't like it getting into everything. Now with that configuration in the lands, there's a wooden block that goes over the top of that 
frame feeder if you're using it and you just pull up that wooden block and you pour your liquid syrup right in there. The other thing is I recommend that if you're tending syrup like that and you have a bunch of them, they have those backpack um, sprayers and they spray liquid like one to one sugar syrup. You could put three gallons of sugar syrup in there, got your little wand, you open it up and you fill it with your little wand, just like a little sugar syrup bartender. Those things work great for that if you have a bunch of them. And it also works for wrapping rounds or anything else. You just got your little squeeze thing and you fill them up as you go and you pump it up and you fill them as you go and you're carrying three gallons on your back. Very little running around with different things. So that works. But anyway, you can't overfeed one-to-one -one sugar water. The only reason that we're using one-to-one -one sugar syrup is because it's a startup colony or they need some help. If it's dwindling and you know you're not gonna be taking honey off of that hive, that's when you can be feeding one-to-one -one sugar water. All of my hives out of the apiary right now, the only one that's being fed is the recent swarm that I captured from a tree, from a maple tree a few days ago. So they are underdogs, they need help, they need sugar syrup, we know we're not harvesting any honey off of them. And so would they overconsume it? Not in my opinion, let them have all they want because one to one they use for ready consumption. When we get into colder times of year, we get into late September, early October, and you've got a colony that really isn't building up resources the way they needed to. Maybe we had really bad weather. Shocking but true. It's happening a lot this year. Rainstorms one right after another. That's when you would end up putting in two to one because the bees start to store that. And that's only, again, with a colony that needs that help. So, hope I answered that question. Next question, Kenneth, Keem or Keim? Anyway, can you discuss single brood chamber management? The timing of the actions you take is still a little confusing. Example, you push your bees down from two hive bodies to one and super them for the main honey flow. With another possible honey coming maybe up in September, when do you pull supers and feed syrup to plug the brood and get the queen started slowing down? Okay, well, I don't feed syrup to the strong colonies going into winter at the end of the year. And if you look at my wintering preparation video, the only boxes that are single deeps are new young colonies. The Colonies that make it through winter, that come into spring, they're in single deeps, and probably they likely have a medium super, which was their honey super. So I leave them in that configuration, a deep and a medium super. That's my minimum configuration, unless it's a late season swarm or something like that. So what they do in spring is we get a spring nectar flow, they fill that medium super, and it's chock a block with honey. That's their insurance policy against dearth periods going through summer. That is also a two box configuration, a deep and a medium that they keep as a minimum going into winter. So I actually don't push them down into a single deep box. So they have that medium super that's untouched by me. So that's their honey stores going through this, what I call the honey bridge. And therefore the honey stores up above that are those that we take off later, or they may get a flow super or something like that. So that is the configuration for winter. Single deep, medium, full of honey. At the end of the year, the only colonies that I would be feeding a heavy syrup going into winter would be late season swarms that didn't have the opportunity or the numbers to build up the resources they need for at least one solid medium super. So that's what I do. Let's make sure that I answered that. Is it safe to wait until closer to the end of September in central USA, Iowa? Yeah, it's safe to wait because mid-September, my bees are still bringing in resources right through the last week. So again, it's about assessing the resources available in the environment and looking at the floral sources that are coming to an end. Uh, we can all get a terrible situation where the bees are on the rise, where they're pulling in lots of resources, and we've all been there where you walk 100 feet from your apiary and you smell the honey you have in the air. And now you're paranoid that bears are going to smell that and they're going to come after it. And after your bees and they're going to eat your larvae. Anyway, so this all happens at the end of the year, but all of a sudden a big series of either really cold days can come, heavy rains can come, 
and prohibit your bees from foraging on those last remnants in the environment. So these are unpredictable things that may require feeding uh, for all of your colonies potentially because that's a critical time for nutrition for the bees because they're making fat-bodied bees going into winter. So, but otherwise, if it's a colony that's been established through the year, I don't feed them at all. Just the new ones. Just the tiny ones. I don't even feed... By the way, I didn't even feed any of my nucleus colonies because I wanted to hold them back. This is why things backfire. You decide you want to build a colony, you want to accelerate them, and maybe you do everything you know to do, and they kind of make it. But then here, I take frames of eggs and brood and nurse bees, and I just randomly tuck them in these five-frame nucleus boxes. And wouldn't you know it, Every single one of those nucleus colonies, no feeding, no interaction, because all I want them to do is raise a queen from one of those eggs. I want her to do her mating flight. I want her to come back, and I want her retinue to be there, and I want enough bees to be in there to keep that queen alive for me in the event that I need a queen in one of my other colonies. But no, they do really well. The queen lays like crazy. They fill all their frames. Now I make double-decker five-frame nukes. So I have 10 deep frames. And uh, they're doing extremely well. No help of any kind, even when I took them out. Because I thought even the brood was getting chilled because we had really cold weather. I thought, oh, good, that's even, that's going to cut them back even more. They'll all cluster around the queen cell and she'll hatch out and they'll look after her. Yeah, because we're literally talking, if you look at a face frame, this is also why I counted the frames on those acorn deals. There's over 3,000 cells here. So when you're pulling a frame out, let's say I was looking in another colony, they're really strong, and I want to hold them back a little bit too, because I'm a backyard beekeeper, I don't want them to swarm, see? So I've got three quarters of this capped brood. And then on the flip side, the back side of it, we've got some open larvae, and then we've got a whole bunch of eggs, you know, in a radius or whatever. Got a bunch of eggs in here. And I go, yeah, I'm gonna take these with all these little worker bees, all the nurses, I'm gonna put them in a box. I'm gonna put a bunch of other frames around them. That's a five frame nucleus colony and uh, leave them alone, see what happens. Yeah, they built queen cells, queen hatched, and uh, they exploded. And that big frame, that big swarm that I had on my tree was from one of my nucleus colonies. So how do you like those bananas? When you don't, you just want them to stay small and cooperate and be a resource if you ever need eggs or if you ever need, you know, to if you want to give eggs to another colony so they can build a new queen. You know, they're right there, they're resources, but instead they did so well that uh, they got out of hand. Swarm dummy. So the other thing is, uh, next question, number 12. This is from Alan Blair, Chatsworth, Georgia. What do you think about treating bees with OAV at night? All the bees would be treated as compared to daytime. I think if you have warm evenings and they're not going to cluster and tighten up because we want them unclustered when we're treating with OAV. What's OAV? Oxalic acid vaporization, by the way. Nothing wrong with doing it at night other than be very safe about that. Some people uh, take risks with oxalic acid vaporization and I'm going to caution you strongly against that. Some people set up a smoker, they watch what direction the smoke is going and then they stand upwind of their oxalic acid vaporization treatment and they think that that's safe. If you go out there at night you're going to see the oxalic acid vapor seeping out of the hives. It's kind of cool looking really and it settles along the ground and follows the ground like a fog. But you're going to want to wear the 3M approved respirator and all the personal protective equipment when you're using oxalic acid vaporization. But absolutely, that's a great time to do it. If you want, you know, depending on how many hives you have, it takes us a little over an hour to treat the apiary with oxalic acid vaporization. And the most effective time for that is when they're broodless. So moving right along. Question number 13, Garrett Bruce, 
In the past videos, you've mentioned that you can tell a lot about your hive by observing the landing board. In this mention, in this video, you mentioned that if there are capped queen cells, you have to find the queen because she may have already departed. It's true, but the time they're capping them, the swarm might have happened. This got me thinking. Could you notice a difference in numbers post swarm by looking at the landing board alone? That's hard. Looking at the landing board alone and the numbers, the behavior on the landing board seems to change a little after a swarm is emitted and after the queen has left. And it also can happen so fast that you walk around and you look at all those hives and you're like, yeah, everybody looks good. So where did that swarm come from? Because they all look normal. They're all carrying on business as usual. You look at the landing board and they're milling about smartly as if nothing has happened. Truth is though, things have changed because what's one of the things that changes on the landing board when the queen's gone, when nobody's laying eggs, when no eggs are hatching and there's no demand for pollen, bee bread, and those resources. Fewer pollen bearing foragers are returning to the landing board. That's my first warning sign when I start looking at landing boards and uh, I like to count the pollen bearing bees that are coming in on each landing board on each hive. And I even have a timer and a clicker. Super nerdy. So you look at them and you start counting them. I have 10 or more this time of year. It's 25 or 30 bees per minute coming in with pollen. So then I go to this hive and I see one bee with pollen every 20 seconds, every 40 seconds. That colony, I 99% guarantee you, has no queen. So that's an indicator. Now we have to look in there. And that's when you find queen cells and you realize they already swarmed. You missed the boat. So yes, you can you could look at your landing boards and you can find... The more you study your landing boards, the more you recognize right away. I have a five-year-old grandson that looks at landing boards now and he knows when one needs attention. They are very keen. So when you teach them to look for pollen, count the pollen. It's a good counting game. And then when they realize there's no pollen coming in, grandfather, you have to come over here. Yes, I make them call me grandfather. You have to come over here and look at this hive. I think they're missing a queen. And they're very confident about it. And they're 99% correct. They're not good at spotting swarming activity though. This one's about to swarm. They run over all alarmed because there's so much activity. And it really is just a, a very bustling hive with lots of nectar coming. Anyway, so let's see what else do we have to talk about. That's it for today. That was the last question. So don't forget to click the like button down there so that you'll know that you've watched this video, even though because now there's, you know, a whole gob of them. 121 weekends of super fun honeybee information. And don't forget to look down in the video description for other links and join us at the Way to Be Fellowship on Facebook. If you know, A lot of people don't use Facebook, but if you use Facebook and you want a fellowship where you can talk about bees and exchange ideas, show your pictures, share your video shorts about what's going on with your bees and get some opinions from a lot of beekeepers all over the world. That's going to be the place. So I hope you join us. Other than that, thanks for being here today. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Thanks again.